I both left home a few days before my 21st birthday. It's one of those rites of passage stories that everybody has and every month must go through. But instead of taking a flat in Croydon or going up country to university, I got on a ship and sailed on a one-way ticket to Australia with only four years as a clerk with the now unfortunately departed Thomas Cook to show for my work experience while still living in the parental home to claim as my life experience thus far. Why would this young greenhorn assume he was up to the task, you wonder? Well, all my friends were petrol heads and getting into cars of various persuasions. I myself fancied something called a Lotus Europa, which was a sort of DeLorean of the 70s, but could never afford the outlay and to loan the insurance, not to mention the sheer bravado of having such a thing parked outside the house, raising the real estate value of the street and pretending to its potential for lifestyle, confidence, bird pulling power, and sheer, I think the word is chutzpah. <laughs> it would sure be a life changer, transforming this shy and nervous child into a swaggering, bird pulling, fast living superhero, possibly after the Jane Bond model. His mum, however, would have known better. The plan, therefore, was to go to Australia, shut myself away on a sheep station for a couple of years to stash away the money to accomplish the purchase on return. Oh, and get a bit of life experience, perhaps, on the way. It seemed like all the kids were travelling at the time, but they were hippies. Another side of my personality is wish list, but I didn't have the gear or the hair and couldn't pretend that I had any musical tastes. I remember the look of disgust on my father's face when News at 10 played some accompanying Hendrix track to announce his death. I had to admit I didn't get it either, but give me a few, a few more years and I would try it. The kids were going to Greece or India, Nepal or Afghanistan and hidden places like that. I had chosen Australia, the destination for thousands of Brits looking to make a new life for themselves in a sun-kissed land, detached bungalows, swimming pool, shared drinks and barbecues with the neighbours, trips to the beach, all this just for giving up the land you had called home for the most formative time of your life. The traditions, the street scene, the countryside, the peculiarity of being British, none of these could be assumed to exist, and indeed didn't in Australia. But while working at Cook's and sending people jet-setting all over the world, visiting Australians had told me about the plentifulness of work over there. So I booked my passage, packed my bags and left. The friend who said, yeah, he would come too, couldn't quite swallow the bullet, and I left him tinkering underneath the hood with the engines of his passion. Later I heard to work with some moose racing outfit and me to choose the indeterminate, wandering, meandering, uncertain, bridge-burning, open-road nature of travel, and never willingly or successfully, until comparatively recently, settling into the inevitability of the work-life-career ethic, but developing on the way a taste for exoticism, Eastern philosophy, and good old existentialism. Three better bedfellows who don't always coexist happily side by side. Time and space does not permit me to recount more than a few facts of that life here. Needless to say, the sheep station I actually made it to, further out in the middle of nowhere than I had ever been, a small quintessential Aussie hick town, if ever there was one, lasted all of two weeks, whereas I, where I was able to display all the fumbling and hand-fisted tasks of the gardener, responsible for lighting the fires, doing chores, forgetting to water the chickens so they could have died if my oversight hadn't been noticed, and, oh yes, killing the sheep that we lived on morning, noon and night. <laughs> this kid had never killed a sheep during his four years off his job in London, but there I was, no going back now, being shown the ropes of how it was done. You chose a sheep from a few in the enclosure, now panic-stricken by the assumption of its fate, wrestled it to the ground, tied its feet together and slit its throat and let the blood spill out before its very eyes. <laughs> now kicking with the last spasms of its fast receding life, those eyes slowly glazing and becoming lifeless and opaque. Then hang it from a hook, slice down the middle, scoop out the gizzards. <laughs> Separate into quarters and joints and cut into chops. Are you vegetarian? Simple. Think you can do it? Luckily I never had to. The erstwhile permanent Scottish gardener decided to return after a sojourn someplace, probably with the bottle, consider his future, realise he had none, either there or here, 
and came back to assume residence for who knows how long and to what unknown conclusion. Meanwhile, one of the otherwise sane and hard-working station hands had drunk himself to oblivion and a couple of ambulance guys came from who knows what distance to cart him off to hospital. I, thankfully, like Nicholas Cage in leaving Las Vegas, was let go, free to frustrate many and various future employers on the long road of turmoil, toil and trouble that would constitute the next 20 or so years. I returned to civilization, Adelaide then to Sydney, sofa surfing, sharing flats, living in rooming houses for single men down on their uppers, or being hospitalized again through the demon drink for which indulgence Australia and its hot and thirsty workers used to be famous. I had seen it before, and presumably so had the ambulance men. You strap them onto the stretcher and cart them off in the van. They were real pros, you could tell. And so I careered about for the next 18 months, which featured mostly unemployment offices, doll queues, building sites, bars and basement storerooms, and falling into debt. If anyone has suffered true homesickness, you know how painful it can be. In the case of Australia, it is exacerbated by news from the homeland, not only about the major headlines of strikes and sporting defeats, but by short paragraph tales from home in the newspapers concerning some of our scandalous little tales, usually swept under the carpet or deemed unworthy of reporting. Why or how these sordid tales, usually of lust-fueled violence, made it to the other side of the world, for its English readers to get nostalgic and misty-eyed about was a mystery, but any news was justified as they imagined the streets and buildings of their previous life erupt into this life-affirming activity. But the main homesick provoking material, apart from TV shows and comedy, was popular music, which was of course exported all over the world, and which was as popular there as on its home turf. You might sometimes catch homespun TV footage of some band's performance, and your imagination would take you to some smoking English pub or venue whence said band may have performed. And when Elton John sang, from the end of the world to your town, you were there, home. Many well-known songs and albums came out during my 18 months in Australia, and I remember the blissful countdown to my return home to be accompanied by such classics as Al Stewart's Year of the Cat, 10cc's airy masterpiece, I'm Not In Love, and another classic, by some small, insignificant English outfit, which we may hear later. And so, by many destinations across the globe, two or three more trips to Australia, and many comings and goings in between, to last week's skiing holiday in Bulgaria. We know that they are now in the European Union, but of course it wasn't always like that. For many of us, Bulgaria was one of those caught between the Iron Curtain and behind the Iron Curtain, as the Soviet Union swept across the eastern half of Europe following World War II, Thereafter, many countries were to disappear seemingly forever into the brutal and soulless model of the Soviet bloc. What most of us would not have known was that back in the late 19th century, in 1878, it was indeed Russia at war with Turkey which had finally liberated Bulgaria from 500 years of Ottoman rule, a terrible subjugation which reduced them to virtual slavery. <coughs> the capital, Sofia, was only established from that time but look in the city museum and you will see the old black and white photographs of a nascent European capital taking its lead from the West. Cars, costumes, suits and shorty hats replacing the colourful traditional folk costumes of the villages. The same symptoms of modernity as can be seen from Buenos Aires to Shanghai. South of Sofia in the Pirin Mountains, the ski resort of Bansko is one of those also symptomatic of today's affluence all the energetic and glamorous youth flexing their muscles while those of us longer in the tooth apply heat treatment to those same muscles we never knew we had, yet alone be called into use. <laughs> the town pulsates particularly at night to the beat, various beats in fact, but if you chance to take a walk further down the hill from all the recent developments, there is an older town established for longer than the come and go tourist ethos of alleyways, enclosed gardens, stone walls and solid stone and timber houses from an old stock proven over time to successfully shelter their occupants from the vagaries of snow and an upland climate. The mountains push their snow-capped tops above the clouds as we descend again at the end of the week. We can see the lie of the land will be missed on our nighttime approach. The mountains become hills and take a long time to flatten into plains. The ubiquitous mountain fir trees thin out to make some form of agriculture, though the dream of a rural idyll of lowland fields 
hedgerows and woods is diminished by the re reality of a scrubby, still stony soil, a picture which only confirms the suspicion one might nurture that all the world is not as bucolically blessed as we are. Occasional towns dot the landscape, the roots of their factories, some faded to obsolescence, with flat blocks stark against plain and sky, EU-funded road building schemes dissect and bisect stony riverbeds, factories, old traditional houses in clusters or straightened into misty and indistinct avenues and lifted from some long forgotten painting from some anonymous artist caught somewhere between the western model and its poorer cousins to the east, many peeling their plaster coats back to the patchy brickwork beneath, their gardens displaying the bare knuckles of fruit trees or vines sculpted across dark, fibrous, trellis-like networks compete with the flat blocks for the living heart of its population. And so to the suburbs of Sofia, drab and grey. No constable skies here with that flicker of blue hope amongst the grey, though that surely must come. Then the city centre, some gayer avenues of restaurants and boutiques and stately official buildings stretch their courses along party lines and religion brings its sombre, heavy-handed or pervading excuses to all this and the arches and golden domes of churches and cathedrals, unseeing in blind adherence to its faith. This was Eastern Europe, orthodox versus the new, revolution and reality, and they survive. <laughs>